facing Europe, but also the rest of the world. I'm uh, Shada Islam, I'm Director of Policy at Friends of Europe, uh, and I'll be moderating this session uh, with our four very eminent panelists. Now with the Paris conference just around the corner on climate change, this is exactly the right moment to try and discuss, reflect and consider where we're at in terms of climate finance and energy remixes and what still needs to be done. And today, during the course of the morning, we'll be looking at three important issues. First session uh, is going to be about that crucial question of financing that transition to low carbon energy. Yes, yes, it's fine to agree that we need to spend more on climate finance, but where's the money going to come from? Will it be enough? How is it going to be used? Um, there will be a conversation later on with James Hansen. Uh, you all know he's a leading US climate scientist who's also the former head of NASA's Goddard Institute for Space Studies. Uh, Mr. Hansen is often called the father of global warming for his early warnings on that uh, crisis. Uh, the second session is about the energy landscape in 2030, a bit of crystal ball gazing to what lies ahead. How will that year be different? How will that decade be different? How will the future be different from what it is today? And in the third session, we'll be looking at the big question of ways of fixing Europe's electricity markets. Now, many of you must have picked up a book that we just did, a publication based on a working group that looked at climate, energy, and industry. And let me just read to you very, very briefly some of the key recommendations that this very high-level working group that brought together experts, MEC, MEPs, policy officials, business said. I mean, the main takeaway, I think, was that it is crucial and it is possible to decarbonize the European economy in a cost-effective manner. And then there were four key recommendations that I would ask the panel to talk about. First of all, the one was take urgent action to reform the EU ETS. No surprises there, needs to be fixed. Um, the second point was the carbon market should be complemented by new financial instruments, such as green bonds with strict EU standards. Um, the third point was that shifting taxes from labor, labor to environmentally harmful behavior resource use and to pollution. So, shift the taxes from labor to environmentally harmful behavior. Uh, fourth point, be, transport, uh, sorry, be transparent about energy subsidies and phase them out as technologies become cost competitive. So these are some of the issues we'll be discussing. Let me just very briefly uh, introduce the panelists to you. They don't really need an introduction, but I'm going to start very, very briefly now with Janos Pasta to my left. He's the United Nations Assistant Secretary General on Climate Change. Thank you very much, Janos, for being here. To my right, Carol Dishburg, Luxembourg's Minister for the Environment, a very important person these days and always. Jonathan Taylor, Vice President for Climate and Environment at the European Investment Bank. Thank you, Jonathan, for being here as well. And last but not least, Alan Sinnott, Director of BlackRock Infrastructure Investment Group. Thank you for coming in from Ireland. Um, the rules of the game are very, very simple. Uh, I'm going to kick off with a question to each one of you. You have five, I was going to say five seconds, but actually you have five minutes. You have five, <laughs> you have five minutes to respond. Uh, I may or may not follow up with uh, a follow-up question. And then once we've done a several rounds, I'll open the floor to questions and comments from you. We have about an hour to do this. So, Janis, I'm going to kick off with you. Very simple question, COP21 round the corner. How possible is it, how realistic is it, to expect a deal on climate finance uh, at that meeting in Paris? So the five second answer is yes. <laughs> but um, okay, let's, um, we've got um, less than 50 days to go and uh, we've got one more week of negotiations starting next week. Uh, we've had lots of informal ministerial and other discussions over the last few months and I think we can be fair to say that there is reasonable convergence on some of the key political issues. What we don't have yet is that reasonable convergence appear in text. We do have a text which was uh, distributed uh, last week. It will be a good basis for negotiation, but uh, it will be, uh, we'll have to see what comes out of next week's negotiation. But I think on the whole, uh, we can be reasonably optimistic about preparations, about the way things are going forward. We have, uh, I use the expression, the stars are aligning. They're not yet completely aligned, but they're beginning to align quite well. Governments really want an agreement. Governments are 
seeing the impacts of climate change around them, and there, they have many political pressures uh, to actually have agreements. The private sector has never been so much behind an agreement as it is now, uh, so that's a very strong force. Uh, civil society is the same. We've learned a lot from the past of what not to do and what not to do, and we will have a radically different approach this time. It's a bottom-up approach where this is what countries really want to do, and I, I think that makes a very big difference. So overall, I think we're in good shape. But a few words about finance, because finance is so important. Uh, you all know the song about money makes the world go round, and uh, the money does help, and it's very important for climate, not just for the investments that have to be made, but also to build trust in the political process between the North and the South and the different countries. So the role of finance is key, and some kind of early agreement or signals about the climate finance package for Paris will be very important to have uh, for successful uh, uh, discussions. Now, the Secretary General of the UN has spoken a lot about climate finance, and for him there are four major elements that we have to see. The first is uh, the 100 billion commitment that developed countries have made to developing countries to provide this 100 billion uh, annually by 2020. Uh, it's a political commitment. It's very important to meet it with a politically credible mobilization trajectory uh, of how this will be met by 2020. And I will say a few words in a second about some progress in this regard. But we also have to make sure that the Green Climate Fund is operationalized and there is also good, uh, good uh, developments in that area. <clears throat> but what is also very important is that the real change from the high carbon to the low carbon future will come from massive investments of uh, trillions of dollars that are happening, but they're not necessarily all going into the low carbon that we need. And those trillions of dollars, they will come from the private sector. They will come from private finance, not from governments. Now, uh, a few words about what happened last week, because there was some important events in Lima, in Peru. Uh, it's the World Bank uh, IMF annual conference, but uh, on the side, uh, the Peruvian and the French government have invited finance ministers to discuss uh, uh, the climate finance package for COP21. And I would just want to mention three things about that. First, the OECD came and prepared a report on the state of climate finance uh, as of today. That is to say, the, the part of the trajectory of the 100 billion. And what we saw there, a report that at the moment, we are at the moment, that is at the end of last year, we're at about $62 billion of, of public uh, of finance for developing countries. About two thirds of it is public and one third of it is private, roughly. And uh, <clears throat> there is already a trend that is going up. So the question is, what will be the rest of the trajectory between now and uh, 2020? Uh, we, at the time of the discussion of the report, we had a number of countries who have committed additional resources, and we also had multilateral development banks who have, uh, uh, and we'll, we'll hear more about that later, who have uh, made pledges. So I think we, we are in a much better shape now, and we can be reasonably confident that the trajectory for the 100 billion can be met. At that same meeting, the Secretary General's climate team, our, our team has produced a report on private finance, uh, which is not related to the 100 billion uh, of the state of affairs. And uh, I can very briefly report just five points and then I will close, that um, there were a number of commitments made last year by private finance uh, groups at the Secretary General's summit and those are being met. That's a very good sign, hundreds of billions worth. Uh, secondly, there is a huge market in green bonds uh, that is it, it's not that huge yet, but it is growing and it's broadening out. That's excellent developments there. There are increasingly companies that are using shadow price for carbon. That's a substantial development. And in the secondary markets, there is generally nervousness and concern about companies that have carbon risk in their investments. And f finally, the insurance companies are going through, uh, in a major way, responding to climate change, both to, as, as insurance companies, but also as investors. So overall, there is a trend taking place in the private finance sector that is very positive, and uh, what we need is now governments uh, to help to change the rules, to improve the situation, and then they can go faster. Thank you.
Thank you. That was very comprehensive. Thank you very much. I'm sure we'll have questions on that. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to turn now to Carol. Um, Janice has painted a fairly positive picture of how things are moving uh, towards the Paris meeting. Uh, the Environment Council recently, the European Parliament just yesterday, talked about the need for the European Union to be a very active participant and to actually scale up its own commitment to climate financing. And I was wondering if you could tell us, Carol, a little bit about whether you think this is going to happen and what are you doing about it? Yes, uh, good uh, morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. And um, yes, climate finance will be a, a key element of the Paris Agreement, uh, of the Paris package, I might say, because if you talk about Paris, it's important to see that, yes, we have an agreement which we are working on the text. We got a short text a few days ago. We will have to, so to solve finance in order to create trust. And if I say solve the problem of finance, that means the political decision of having 100 billion a year by 2020. So uh, on this issue, we are working very hard on the environmental minister's side, but also on the finance minister's side. So in July, we had on the environmental minister meeting, uh, not only Jonathan Taylor, but also uh, Hela Shekroku from Green Climate Fund, which will play an important role in climate finance. And we presented a toolbox of all instruments already existing now, um, like, um, like multilateral banks, like funds, like uh, what G7 outcome of the insurance sector. So lots of initiatives are already uh, helping to scale up climate finance. And then we got in the last month some of the European member states scaling up what they promised to do as Germany, UK did, uh, France did, Luxembourg did too. So lots of good and positive momentums. For example, for three, three weeks ago in New York, there was some uh, announcement and what we see at the moment, Europe is already delivering a lot, is giving positive um, movement to this finance issue because it will be key to create trust. This is the political commitment we made to have 100 billion. But what is more important and what is part of the Paris is really that the Paris Agreement will be able to shift the investment, to have a paradigm shift in investments. In order to do so, we need a good framework with robust rules. So in this, um, in this um, working field, European Union has had a mandate on 18th of September, and I will highlight the three main points. So in order to shift investments, in order to have predictability, which is really important for business and civil society, we need a good long-term target telling us a clear direct trajectory to have, we call it in a European language, near zero or below at the end of this century, a clear tra trajectory that there's no way back, that we have to shift the investments. We have to translate this two degree target in order to be understandable by everyone. Secondly, we need, if I just came back from Rabat, where we had a forum about uh, intended nationally determined contributions. So every country, is, and we have 151 parties who submitted their INDCs. So now we see that 90% of the worldwide emissions are covered by plans that national governments are making. This is a real movement, it is a real big momentum to say that 90% of emissions are covered. So we're going to this global, because the Paris Agreement has to be a global agreement where, which is inclusive and to take, so that everyone will take part of it. So. We have these INDCs, but these are not only numbers, but they have to be implemented. In order to do this, we need this long-term target and we need to fill the gap. Because if we look at the INDCs, we go, are not going to reach our two degrees target. And in order to fill the gap, European Union is very hard working on the, on the uh, five years uh, ambition mechanism. In order to scale up, to regularly review and then scale up our ambitions. Because we know if technolo technology evolves as fast that we will be able to scale up our ambition in order to fill up the gap and to be credible. 
and to meet the target. And the third thing on the European uh, mandate is that the agreement has to be transparent. Uh, we have to have accountability, so it needs, the text needs to be strengthened. We have to have good rules, and this is the key issue, I think. We need to have good political rules in order to have this paradigm shift in investment, in order to move private sector to invest, because the investments we made, for example, in infrastructure, these are big investments, and, they have, and we need them for a long time, so we need, need to have urgent action. That will be my last point. We see that if you look at Paris package, we have Lima Paris action agenda. And this agenda shows that the revolution is already taking place, that cities are doing so much, that there's so much movement outside world. And we need to translate this also in the Paris agreement, in, or in the Paris package, I may say, in order to show that it makes economic sense to shift as fast as possible. Okay, I'm going to come back to some of these issues that uh, have, have raised. I mean, we're getting some very good vibes about what's happening, but, you know, the proof of the pudding is in the eating, as it were. So we have to look at how this uh, money can actually be raised. But let me turn now to, to you, uh, Jonathan. Lima, the multilateral development banks, Janos referred to their commitment and to their uh, important contribution to this. Give us a little bit of your insight on what really is happening there or happened there. Well, thanks very much, Shada. Um, uh, so, yes, just picking up on that first, uh, and I agree very much with Janos that the 100 billion commitment is an absolute key political imperative, and we need, we need to get there. And so what happened in Lima, which focused very, as far as uh, finance is concerned, was and climate finance is concerned, was focusing very much on this 100 billion point, is that, uh, is that a number of the multilateral development banks in particular as Carol was saying, um, uh, uh, either reinforced or, or, or renewed the pledges which they have to be diverting um, uh, m some of their monies uh, in the direction of, of climate finance, both adaptation and mitigation. But I think mostly adaptation as far as the north to south transfer is concerned. And that's what I just want to pick up on that point because the, it's important to sort of unpack the numbers here a little bit. I mean, the 100 billion which we're talking about vitally important politically, is really about the north-south transfer, but that's only part of the story. Uh, there are plenty of south-south transfers going on, but of course, as far as, as, far as mitigation is concerned, north-north is just as important. Uh, and indeed, uh, there is a very considerable amount uh, going on there and more that needs to be done. So I think that in that context, those pledges were, were very good. I mean, we, my institution made a, made a pledge to up the proportion of monies which are going to, uh, uh, to, towards climate in the countries concerned related to the uh, OECD CBI paper. I, won't, I won't, won't unpack that one too much, but to, to, to raise that to 35%. Uh, and we have an overall 25% commitment anyway, as far as all our lending is concerned, which amounts to last year 19 billion euro. But I think it's not just about money. I think it's also about where, where the money goes. I think it's focusing on impact. It's focusing, as I said, on adaptation. It's focusing also on mainstreaming. And I think that we need also to be making a much bigger collective effort in terms of our data gathering, in terms of our definitions, in terms of the way in which we measure all these things, because otherwise it's going to be really quite difficult to, 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 to benchmark ourselves against them. That is something also which the multilateral development banks are working very intensively on in order to make some progress in that, in that way. Uh, private finance, though, ultimately is the key to this because uh, multilateral development banks and indeed public finances generally can only provide part of the story. So we need to think of ways of uh, getting and attracting private finance in. Uh, the MDBs are working on instruments. Um, I'm very happy to go on at some length about the instruments which, which, which we've developed, but, but, we're, but we're all working on that to try to get that private finance in. Green bonds is another important, uh, important aspect of the, of the story. Uh, that's, uh, um, we were pioneers of green bonds in 2007. That's now moved away from the multilateral development banks into the private sector, as Janos was saying. Last year, there were about, um, from memory, about $38 billion worth of green bonds issued, which is a great number compared to naught in 2007, but is still a very tiny part of the overall, overall market. I'm positive about that. It, 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 it indicates to me that there's a huge upside, which we can do more of, and I'm sure Alan might want, to, might want to say a little bit more about that later. 
But just to finish off, you picked up on the four recommendations in the paper and asked us what we, what we thought of them. And um, I mean, I, 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 I wouldn't disagree with any of them. I think they're all very good. I think they're all uh, important sort of necessary conditions. I don't think they're sufficient, however. I think there are other things which need to be done as well. Uh, in particular, if you're talking about getting in private finance, um, private, private investors respond to incentives. Uh, and so what, what you need to do is you need to find ways in which you can uh, both identify and provide an income stream which will reward those private investors for investing. But second, you need to ensure that the overall framework, and this is a key role for governments, that the overall framework in which they are investing is one which is sufficiently stable and predictable that, uh, that, they, that they have the incentive to, to tie up their money for a long time, which is what they're going to have to do. And that means that if you, are, if you have in place, for example, an economic regulatory regime relating to the use of renewable energy in your jurisdiction, it's pretty important to uh, ensure that that uh, regime is one that the investors can be confident will stay like that for the lifetime of their investment. Otherwise, they simply won't put the money in. I think that's what I'd say just in terms of an introduction. Actually, you've just asked Alan the question. <laughs> I, I don't need to ask you the question, Alan, exactly what... Uh uh, Jonathan is saying, I mean, what do you guys need? Uh, what, what, what are the investment decisions you're taking and what are they based on? Yeah, uh, thanks very much, Shada, and, and also Jonathan. I, I think it's, it's a great topic to think about how the private sector thinks about deploying capital and climate finance and long-term investment. And by way of perspective, um, I think many, many people in the policy world may not be familiar with BlackRock. We're a large investment manager, one of the largest in the world. Um, we're, we're probably one of the largest buyers of green bonds globally. Uh, and I work inside the infrastructure investment group where I spend my days uh, speaking to a range of global investors, pension funds, insurance companies, sovereign wealth funds, endowments, family offices. So um, I think the first thing that people should recognize is this, this is all relatively new for the private sector. Even within private infrastructure investment, uh, 10 years ago there was almost zero in infrastructure funds under management. In a decade it's grown to 330 billion and evolved dramatically. Um, in that time frame, uh, I, I, we, we've uh, invested about seven and a half billion dollars, in, in, including uh, four separate renewable funds. And the reason we, we've created uh, slices uh, of, of offerings for investors is because you have to talk about risk when you speak to investors. They're actually not always thinking about return. They're thinking about downside risk. And I think that's a topic we should bring up today and, and maybe tease out. But, but there is absolutely an evolution in the investor mindset Increasingly, we're looking at a move to long-termism. We're seeing more and more interest in real assets. Uh, we're seeing the ability to, to be patient and deploy capital at very moderate returns for the long term. Uh, and I think that this is nicely borne out. Um, last year, the, the World Economic Forum surveyed 900 of its members and said, you know, what are the top 10 risks you think about? And, and uh, number two was extreme weather risk, risk. And number seven was natural catastrophes. So, so again, you know, climate uh, and the climate risk is looming large in investor mindsets. Um, so with that, I, I might pause and, and, and I can drill down on any, any specific questions. Thank you very much, Alan. You've actually been very, uh, very, very good with the timing. So I'm going to actually follow up. And, and, and when we talk about new forms of financing, when we talk about new sources, new products, which, which are the ones that you think are the ones that really investors are keen on and go for? I think, um, again, it's, it's not one size fits all, and I think that's what people really, really have to, have to understand. Um, but, but the more you think of a common language of risk, especially in equity inv investment, the more investors become comfortable with where they can allocate capital to along a risk spectrum. Um, the conversation today will, will verge between green bonds, investing in developed markets, invest in, investing in growth markets, capital flows. Uh, for an investor, that, that's an allocation decision, because it is worth remembering uh, it's the planned participants of pension plans that, that are the end users of all the, these investors. And, and I might say, we, we actually invest on a purely fiduciary basis, which means it's not our own capital. It is be, be on behalf of public service employees, uh, fire people, you know, uh, a wide range of end users. And that's why risk is really the number one topic we engage with uh, broadly. And I, I think the one common uh, theme we're hearing at the moment is the need for transparency. Um, in, in data, in disclosure, um, I think the more and more you can actually discuss the risk of your portfolio, the risk of, client, uh, of climate, and, and 
boil that down in a way that needs to be reported, and I, I, I might circle back on this in terms of regulation and policy on how, how this ties together. We, we've, we've spoken on stimulus a lot, but uh, if you have people thinking about climate ri risk as something they need to engage on, report on, I think that that is, is probably one of the single biggest tools that can take us to the next level. Just very quickly to follow up with Janos, you know, this is, uh, you said 100 billion uh, every year, uh, but more is needed, trillions and trillions. What are, what are developing countries uh, saying about this? What is the industrialized developing country nexus going to be in terms of raising this finance? Okay, so uh, first, just let's come back for a second to the 100 billion. And uh, uh, as we said, I think we all agree that this is a political commitment. It has to be met in a politically credible manner, which I think is on the way to to success. We're not quite there yet, but I think we're, we're getting there. But it is nevertheless very important, serious money for small countries, small islands, uh, least developed countries where market penetration is not that good. They're too small for the big companies to engage in, in any serious way. So there, a few billions here and there make a big difference. But it really the question is about the, 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 the big investments in the world, those trillions, and they will come from the private sector. Uh, it was interesting, uh, Jonathan, you mentioned the north-north, and, and, but there's also south-south, and there's quite a lot of it. And it's, uh, some of it is just plain investment, some of it is uh, now increasingly called south-south cooperation. Two weeks ago, we had the uh, General Assembly events in New York where heads of states were there. Uh, the president of China came with lots of very positive messages in his pocket about uh, uh, climate change related issues and he also came with a few billion dollars in his pocket for South-South cooperation. So uh, that, that is an important uh, part. But even that is just billions, it's not the trillions. And this is where working with the private sector and, and I think the challenges we have, and this is, you know, I, I am a bureaucrat, I'm, I'm not from the private sector, but, but we've been trying to work with the private sector for the years and the, the challenge is that we have small amounts of public money, you know, small billions, right, but small amounts of public money, but we have lots of public actions that we can do and what is the collection of those that will unleash the trillions in the right direction? That is the challenge that we're facing. And, and uh, what, what we have found in this uh, uh, small report that we have prepared for Lima is that the private sector is already moving in uh, this, clearly in this direction. Well, you know, whether it's the green bonds or it's the uh, carbon price or, or just simply uh, making decisions at this point, partly because of the market is already pushing us in that direction, but partly because these are companies that see the next steps ahead and they see the writing on the wall that we're going to a low carbon future. So they are making these decisions together. In total, however, we're not quite there yet, not because the, the quantity uh, and the rate of change is just not enough for what we need for climate change. Now, what is it that we need? We need, uh, this is where we need, of course, more companies, but they will come either because the market makes it very clear to them or and this is the important part, th there needs to be change in rules. The rules need to evolve. And this is where governments can come in, and this is where that small, that the actions that governments can do is not just simply provide a few billion in cash, but try to improve uh, the regulatory environment, the export-import uh, regulations, and lots of other things that they can do to change the rules, to improve the rules, so that the capital can flow more easily uh, to where we need to have them. Um, I'm going to open the floor. I'm going to ask you a question, uh, Cara, but I also want to get uh, uh, comments and questions from the floor, lots of expertise and knowledge here. Um, would you just give me a show of hands now to how many people want to come in and ask our panel questions uh, related to the subject of climate financing uh, to a low carbon? Uh, any, any other hands coming up? Yes, I see one, uh, two, okay. Uh, I'll start here on the left first. I see someone on the right. Please, could you put up your hand and... Uh... Hi, um, I'm Marta Borhaug and I work for Aviva, uh, which is um, a, a big investor in, um, uh, in, in, at the global stage and, and we work a lot with BlackRock and other asset management um, and investor companies to, to try and encourage more investment to flow into to climate finance. Um, 
I have a bit of a question to the panel, um, uh, but I just wanted to say that um, over you recently published a report together with the Economist Intelligence Unit where we tried to put a number on the value at risk for investors and they came up with the number 13.5 trillion dollars. That's the, that's the value at risk for investors and the value at risk for governments is even greater. So we think that tackling climate change and investing in cl climate change friendly companies uh, and projects is just, it's not, it's not because we're just trying to be nice. This is a business imperative. Um, so what, what, what do we want and what do we think we, that can help? I think BlackRock alluded to this earlier. The financial system is currently not geared up to help us channel finances through to those companies that are performing best on climate change um, uh, indicators. So one of the things we've, we've asked for, and I, I'd be interested in the panel's views on how we can go about doing this, is we've asked the UN to look into producing a, um, a resolution on sustainable finance, and we've also asked the OECD to draw up some kind of a convention on what's called fiduciary duty for investors, which is gonna s help set right. out how can we as investors um, do what we should do for the people that we are um, managing the assets okay. for. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much indeed. I'll take one, uh, yeah, two hands going up here. Could you keep your hand up so my colleagues can actually see you? Please, could someone take a... <laughs> thank you. Thanks. Uh, if I could make a plea for short questions, uh, okay. because that way, that way we get a real conversation going. Uh, I, ha I had not yet started, so. No. <laughs> Just a warning. I can stop here. <laughs> no. Okay, so uh, Geneviève Pons, I'm the director of WWF uh, Europe. And, um, well, for me, there is a strong, strong link between uh, market and, and rules. So, uh, uh, companies, uh, I, I was also in New York, companies are requesting signals and they are requesting a carbon price and they are requesting a tax shift and uh, i would like uh, some of the speakers to come back on that that's the perfect length for a question thank you very much indeed uh, i'll take one more lady at the back hand up please keep your hand up so my colleagues can see you yes there the hand that's up yep <laughs> come to you as well Please go ahead. Thank you. Um, Stefan Singer, Director of Global Energy Policy for WWF. I have a question um, regarding another financial mechanism which has been agreed by the party, which is not adaptation mitigation finance, but nevertheless a very important agreement by the UN, and this is loss and damage. For those who are most vulnerable, most poor, which need to be compensated in one way or the other. We do not see much movement in that one, but it has been agreed. So Janos, in particular, I'd like to hear from you what steps the uh, UN might take to leverage funding, which is, not, um, which is not money from the private sector. Let's be honest, it's not profitable. And also from um, the European Union, I would like to hear more about potentially supporting the loss and damage because it is a key issue, creating alliances with the most vulnerable countries and the OSIS countries, the small island states. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll take one question here in front. Please keep your hand up. My colleagues can't see otherwise. Could you bring a microphone here in front, please? Okay, and then I'll turn to the panel for some responses. Yeah, please. Thank you very much. Giles Dixon from the European Wind Energy Association. We have seen significant growth in recent years in the investments that pension funds and the insurance sector are putting into both onshore and offshore wind. Those investments tend to be in the refinancing of wind farms that have already been built and have been operating for three or four years. Uh, question to Alan, are you seeing any increased appetite among institutional investors in the financing as opposed to the refinancing of renewables, a readiness to cover construction risk, technology risk where necessary? Okay, thank you. I'm going to turn to Carol and then the other panelists, and then we'll take another round of questions. I think we'll have time if everyone's short and to the point. 
Um, I may s make some general comments on the first intervention, um, and I, I, I may just tell you, yes, I've been to New York and Paris to the business dialogue, and business is asking for a solid and robust uh, carbon, price, carbon pricing, and yes, as governments, we should be really clear, and we should, um, so on European level, we are about having the first discussion on the ministerial level about um, the ETS reform, um, there is lots of movement and we have to improve and modernize our legislation concerning energy and I think on, on, on the energy uh, efficiency and renewables are really the key if we want and there we have to have uh, good um, incentives as a European Union. We have already experienced policies in that area, we are equipped with policy and directives, so we should share this more and we will focus a lot on capacity building, uh, technology transfer and someone said this is a business opportunity also and, it, and in my introduction I said it's simply economic thinking uh, that we have to have a good policy in order to be able to be competitive for the future economic um, development that we, we want to have. So this is one kind. So politics have um, to send very uh, clear signals. Business is calling for this and, and as you said, predictability is, is, is really um, important. Uh, coming back to the, to the question about uh, loss and damage and about poor and vulnerable. In our mandate, uh, we tackled um, in paragraph five, we said that we will scale up climate finance for the poorest and the most vulnerable because we know that this is really important. And on paragraph 14, we recalled the will to um, scale up finance and to have this 100 billion. So we, we have this twice in our mandate and European Union is really aware that this, this will also be crucial in order to have the ambitious framework in Paris that we need in order to have everyone on board because it's not simply promising something, it's really about security and saving lives and uh, living uh, and the planet. So we are aware of it, this and um, we, we declare that we will scale up what we do, not only on mitigation, but also on adaptation, which is really important also for the outside world, not only EU. We have mitigation and adaptation in a, man in a balanced manner and we see those all in a dynamic but Carol, manner. if I may just uh, ask, you know, it's all very well to make the promises and we've seen in the case of the ODA debate, the promises are made, it's more difficult to keep those promises and in this case, if we're right, I mean, we really do have to do it because otherwise disaster, further disaster is lurking ahead. Yes. So we have to be vigilant? I mean, is, yeah. what, what's the... Yeah, and I may say that um, we, have, we just agreed in New York something very, very um, important. We agreed on the sustainable development goals. goals. Yes. And uh, basically, that's what we have to do. We have to align policies. And that will be one of, of the, the big discussions to make, to mainstream the sustainable climate uh, theme in all decisions we make as politicians, in all what we plan to do for the future. So alignment policies will be one of the key issues mm -hmm. Environment ministers will also talk about phasing out environmentally and, cl and climate um, harmful subsidy. So this will be one of the discussions which I think is the most useful. Mm. How to mainstream our politics, detect where are the barriers that we face in order to have a, a right. good and um, a good planning for a more sustainable development of our economies. Right, thank you. Alan, would you like to come in on, uh, and I'll turn to you, Jonathan. Yeah, I, I may join together two questions there. Um, we, we, we got a, a question on policy, and, uh, and someone used the term rules, and then we, we got a t uh, could you, question. Could you hold your, yeah. And then we got a question on um, refinancing, which, which in a broader context is really about direct capital to new projects. <clears throat> so financing new build of, of wind and solar. If I may, the, the first message the private sector might give to the public sector is, is the public sector ha hasn't really done a great job on changing the rules. Um, it, I, we, we, you know, we started seeing capital flow to Spain. They changed the revenue policy. Um, Australia introduced a cap and trade policy for carbon, changed that after two years. Uh, 
In the U.S., our renewables policy changes every two years. It works in two-year cycles for 25-year assets. Uh, in the U.K., as recently as this year, there was no harmonization between the Department of Energy and Climate Change and the U.K. Treasury when they changed the tax regime for U.K. renewables projects. So there's a consistent pattern of changing the rules from our perspective. So when we look at, at, at where the risk is, it's elevated. Therefore, the cost of capital to finance renewables is elevated. Um, that's why uh, primary capital has not flowed to offshore, because the risk is elevated. People will, will do it, but it, it's at a higher risk premium. Um, we are seeing refi because that's, that's seen, seen as more de-risked, uh, but, but there is also um, a desire to, to, um, to put primary capital in there. And I might say, uh, many of the institutions, such as the EIB, um, such as the UN Green Climate Fund, I mean, th there, are, there are things happening that give confidence, but we'd, we'd like a longer pattern of confidence. A uh, very, very fair point. Uh, Jonathan, would you like to come in? This inconsistency issue, I think, Alan, that you pointed to is, is, is a very, very relevant one. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, indeed, I sort of, I, I referred to that as well earlier on, and I do think it is extremely important. Um, just to pick up on one or two of the, one or two of the points which people were making, um, I, I'm, I'd leave it to Janos to comment on the, on, on, on the UN producing a resolution or whatever, but I mean, on the, on the idea of the OECD drawing up a, uh, a convention on fiduciary duties for investors. I mean, that seems to me to be quite a good idea. Um, it, it, wouldn't, it doesn't seem to me to be sufficiently granular to be sort of actually addressing the problem. I mean, by definition, an OECD uh, uh, convention will be fairly high level. So, I mean, if, if one wanted to pursue that, presumably one would also want then that to be cascaded down into, into individual, uh, into individual uh, conventions in different, different jurisdictions. Um, much the same sort of point actually uh, ap applies to the points about carbon pricing and tax shift because I completely agree on the sentiment. Don't get me wrong on that. But I'm just, uh, I mean, as far as carbon pricing is concerned, we have a mechanism which doesn't work terribly well. Um, what we do as an institution uh, is that when we are making our own uh, uh, decisions about where we're going to lend to, we build, we build carbon pricing into the project appraisal and we use a number, depending on how long the project is, but we're using, we use a number internally of about 30 to 50 euros per tonne, which is about, what, six times, the, six times the current price of the ETS. So we're doing that for our own internal purposes, right. and I mean, I would encourage others to do that too. Whether you can get people to do it on a top-down basis, I'm just less sure about. And that also applies to the point about tax, because, I'm, again, I'm all for sort of um, putting subsidies in the right place and removing removing subsidies from the wrong places and shifting taxes as, as far as one does it. Um, but it seems to me that at a, at a policy level, you can set this at, uh, uh, internationally, you can set this only at a relatively high level. And heaven knows, we don't find it very easy even within the European mm. Union or indeed even within the EU 15 to arrive at common tax rules. So it's not going to be that easy to come up with, with them at a, at a wider level than that. Thanks. Janos, very, very quickly. Yes, if you want to respond, and then I want to take another round of questions, please. So prepare your questions if you have them, and have your hands ready to be raised. Yeah, very, very quickly, so first on the Aviva question. Uh, well, the UN resolutions, that, that's a challenging prospect. So uh, I, I'm not saying one shouldn't do it, but we need to be very clear what is in there. Uh, but it's uh, on, on the other point about uh, th this was very, very much part of our report as a second major message that uh, increasingly in the secondary markets there is concern about companies that have the carbon risk and of course in some places some take it as far as divestment the secretary general has not been pushing for divestment but he has been clearly pushing for increasing investment in the low carbon economy and it was great to see a very strong presence from WWF at this event uh, just one more word on the carbon price that whether, whether, unfortunately, carbon price at the global level will not be part of the negotiations uh, at this time. Uh, but at the same time, there's all these different things happening by private sector companies, by, uh, and, and what, in a recent discussion uh, with the representatives of those companies, we felt that what was really important is for those actors who are really engaged in this, come together now and try to begin some kind of bottom-up 
process of, of, of not coordination because that's too strong perhaps, but begin to talk about harmonizing measurements so that people understand and a ton measured by this company is a ton measured by that company. And that would be very helpful for the future. Thank you. Thank you. Um, could I have uh, another show of hands? Yes, fine. Could I? Yes. Um, gentleman over here. And then John. About Ryan, uh, Friends of Europe. A simple question. We have 500 billion tax subsidies on the, on the earth on fossil products. Can we hope that Paris comes with a strong statement that these have to disappear within the next 10 years? And can we hope, as far as the EU is concerned, that the taxes on fossil fuels, which is uh, gas, would be doubled in the next 10 years? Thank you, Eberhard. Thank you. John, just pass the microphone on to John. Yeah, th uh, thank you, John Cooper, Fuels Europe. Just a short question for each of the panelists. Uh, we've heard a very good um, discussion about the, the future of climate finance, but could I ask each of the panelists what do you believe would be the right criteria for selecting the right projects and the right investments to use this climate finance? Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, yes, gentlemen over here and then there. And okay. But if you ask very quick questions, we're doing okay. Um, will do. Mark Johnston from EPC, thank you. Um, Carol, uh, yesterday Parliament fixed its position on Paris and the policies that flow. Um, one of those was a call to use um, ETS revenues as a contribution towards uh, climate finance um, from Europe. Um, so that, that's not on the Council agenda now or this year, um, but, and I choose my words carefully, do you you or your delegation, not the council as a whole, think um, that is something the council should consider seriously uh, when the issue is on your table in the new year. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Uh, I saw two hands go up there. Yes, please, the lady there, and then that's it. I'll take one more. Yeah, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Lise Kleines from Oxfam. Um, actually, interesting that the question was just raised. I wanted to, on, on the ETS revenues, I wanted to highlight the fact on the, on the reports of the $100 billion that uh, as we're looking to deliver climate finance to developing countries that we're still looking at the aid pot very much to help deliver that money to, to, to support developing countries. Um, the OECD reported that 20% of ODA is now being used as climate finance with a growing trend. Yep. And you, you raised the question as well, Chair, that this is an increasing issue also to, to deliver on the commitment. So um, mobilizing innovative sources is key. Yep. ETS could actually tripled the EU's contribution to the Green Climate Fund. We've done some, some studies looking into setting aside 10% of ETS revenues, which could deliver $3 billion a year. And it's a really important uh, source to help, particularly with adaptation, possibly also loss and damage um, in, in a post-2020 yeah. scenario. Thanks. Thank you very much. I'll take one question. Uh, sorry, but, you know, this conversation is for the day, so we will continue. <laughs> Just one there, right at the back. Yeah. Thank you, Pascal Gabriel from the Global Relations Forum. Um, I just have really quick questions. Uh, first one, what is, uh, how do you see uh, the role of China in the Paris negotiation? Second one, how would you define green finance? Is it an interesting concept? And finally, given the challenges ahead, uh, would the 100 uh, billion, would you call it a success in Paris? Is it the main uh, element of success? Thank you. Okay, that was a quick question, so I'll take a question from the gentleman over here. Uh, please keep your hand up. Okay, thank you, Jean-Pierre Arnaud, uh, Belgian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. A short question. Uh, I'm missing a bit of point on innovation and technology uh, and financing research. So I've been very impressed by what Tesla did on the batteries technology, which is a very huge game changer in, in the future. Where are the public investments? Uh, I don't see really a match between private and public there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much to the audience for very good questions and also to being brief. I think we've, we're on a good line here. Alain, I'm going to start with you and go backwards, actually, this time around. So please, pick and, pick and choose. You don't have to answer every single question. Certainly. Um, I, I might, might start with the criteria question. and um, it, it's, it's not as complicated as you, as you think to price risk. 
Um, you know, we generally terms of th think in terms of equity, but um, most investors also deploy debt capital or credit where there's, there's a very simple and straightforward globally recognized scoring system in terms of credit ratings. You start with the risk free rate, then you look at the geography, the sovereign, uh, the revenue proposition. So um, I, I don't mean to get too de technical, but, but, but there is a, a, a very, fairly straightforward methodology, but, but the big things that are looked at is the risk free rate, where that's going, long term interest rate assumptions, the geography you're operating in, revenue certainty, uh, and, and you can get there quite quickly. Um, in terms of bringing it together as well, in, in terms of disclosure, um, one, one thing I, I should mention is investors globally are increasingly looking at, at what they own and, and the need for transparency in their portfolio to shine through. And I think that policymakers can really encourage that. Um, when I leave here today, I have actually a, a call with uh, one of the largest insurance companies where we're working on, on at their demand, uh, to create a template of disclosure of what what they own and what risks they have inside their portfolio. And last Friday, for, for the very first time ever, we were talking to a US state pension, and they have paid a large global consultant to do specific diligence on ESG risk in the managers they're diligencing. Uh, ESG, I've, I've heard spoken about a lot, but this was the first time we've ever seen a state plan pay to, to, for us to be diligenced on ESG. So I thought that was quite a breakthrough too in terms of disclosure. Would you like to say something about green finance? Sure, I, I, I think green, green finance is qu quite a broad term. Um, you know, again, it's easily measured along a spectrum of risk. Uh, the Tesla example is a great example of something that's worked well, but, but I can list uh, 10 or 12 other battery companies that have failed. Um, so there's debate and, you know, you, you can, in our world, you, you know, I, I think there was a lot of blowback about Solyndra in the US, which was, you know, in some ways government financed but there was also a lot of uh, uh, solar technology companies that did progress. So, so on the, that, that's probably on the, the more risk on end of the spectrum uh, and, and uh, happy to discuss at length. Coffee time is a good time to discuss these things as well. Please, Carol. Yes, I try to be, for, um, try to be short. Uh, Paris needs to, be, to send a strong message. For this, we need a strong agreement we, and we see that at the moment the text is lacking of ambition, so Europe will fight for more ambition in the text. And I explained it will be a long-term target, cycles to scale up, and, um, and we need good, robust rules, common methodology, accountability and transparency. That is key for Paris, for Europeans, and we're going to fight for that, to have a legally binding agreement which gives a good base. So for the question coming from Parliament, this is really interesting because we're going to have the first discussion among environment ministers about the reform of the ETS. And this is exactly one question. You know, I will ask them in a more diplomatic way, but I'm going to tell you what we do at home. So in Luxembourg, we scaled up our climate finance. Uh, we pledged uh, last year five uh, millions, which is nearly 10 euro per person, uh, to the Green Climate Fund. And we're going to do this annually from now till 2020. And we scaled up our climate finance to 120 million euro, which means 240 euro per person. We do not only double, we make it five times as high. And we make it on top of the ODA. We separate this. But it will be important to mainstream the ODA, so to have climate also in the ODA and to mainstream our politics. In order to answer the 100 billion question, this is not really a key issue of the agreement for me, but it is enabling to have a good and a strong agreement. This is uh, the, yeah, the trust builder. We must be able to deliver on that. So Europe already now uh, is delivering half of, of um, uh, green climate uh, fund pledges. We are scaling up, we are on the right way, but we have to do more and we know this. And uh, so for me, to answer your question, we take the money out of what we get from the Kyoto Center. So we have complete transparency that we use what we get from fossil fuels and give it into, into uh, climate finance. So for me, uh, transparency, and it has been mentioned here, transparency, what we're doing is really important and uh, 
hopefully I've answered your questions. I'm looking forward to the discussion because it will be, uh, I think, a very interesting discussion on a European level. Thank you, Carol. Uh, Jonathan, please. Well, ju I'll just pick up on a couple of the things, um, specifically on definitions, because I think that's quite an important, an important area. Um, so green finance is quite a nebulous sort of term, and I think the most important thing to say about it is that green finance actually goes rather wider than climate. Um, so there are lots of things, but I mean, obviously, obviously it shouldn't be negative for climate, but there are lots of things which are good for green finance, which are basically climate neutral. So if you're talking about biodiversity or whatever, this is a good thing in itself. It may not, action which you take to promote biodiversity may or may not have a positive impact on, on climate, but it won't have a negative one, but it may not have a positive one because you may be doing it for different reasons. Um, more specifically, I think, just to, just, uh, I, I, uh, as I said um, earlier on, um, we are, and the other MDBs are putting a lot of work into uh, trying to arrive at common terms and common standards for the purposes of defining precisely what we are doing as climate finance and what isn't climate finance. And so it is actually very important to get these definitions clear. Um, the easier bit of it actually is in relation to green bonds because with a green bond, the whole point is that you have to uh, demonstrate to the investor that there is a clear read across between the money which the investor is putting in and the read across into a particular set of projects. So that's a relatively easy way of doing it. The harder way of doing it is for, is, is for the bigger things. I just want to just pick up on uh, one thing which we haven't picked up on it because somebody asked about China. Uh, I don't think I've got anything very specific to say about China, except that plainly China is a is a enormous player, um, both as a country in which uh, uh, action needs to be taken, but also uh, as a country which is which is now stepping up to the plate uh, and providing contributions. And I would actually just just mention just in the last couple of days, China has actually just issued its own green bonds for the first time. So that's um, that's a signal, I think. Thank you very much, Janice, please. Thank you. A couple of points, uh, a lot of them have been already addressed. On the fossil fuel subsidy question, I'm afraid that uh, the situation is not that great. We keep reaffirming our previous commitments to get rid of those. Uh, even some of the discussions for the G20 preparations are re reconfirming the 2009 commitment. So uh, uh, earlier this year, I attended a meeting in Washington of finance ministers, and one of them said, if we get to Paris and all we can say is to recommit ourselves to removing those uh, fossil fuel subsidies, then we're really not doing our job. But I'm afraid it doesn't look like it's going to change. <laughs> so uh, that's not very good. Uh, on the um, uh, Oxfam uh, point, uh, at, the, at this meeting in Lima, the Secretary General of OECD made it very clear that there's 19 billions out of those 62 uh, that is actually development finance that is now called climate finance. And, and it's not a shift because it has always been there. It just wasn't called climate in the old days. It's about energy, it's about renewable energy, it's about things like that. What he did say is that since OECD is the, the organization that tracks development assistance through the DAC, if they do notice any substantial shift from other development pockets to climate, they will make that clear and they will make that known. So that's a promise that we heard from the Secretary General. On the role of China, in addition to what you said, Jonathan, I think in the climate negotiations over the last few years, what has become very clear is that they have become a proactive, very constructive force uh, based on very solid national plans. They have something to bring to the table, they're delivering, and uh, that's been actually very positive. Uh, President Xi, who came to the UN General Assembly his pockets were full of good things to say, <laughs> and also <laughs> money, <laughs> and also other support. So these are all things that are, they're, they're concrete. Uh, and um, just very briefly on the investment, uh, innovation and technology, uh, this is very important. Uh, we didn't talk much about the action agenda that we will be showcasing at the Paris conference together with France and Peru, but there will be a whole day dedicated to innovation and technology, and I hope you will come to that event and look at all the great things that are happening in the world. Thank you. Mm, great things happening in the world, definitely, I think, but you know, the proof of the pudding is in the eating, as I said, so I think we're not going to sit back and let you guys get, get away with anything. Uh, we will keep watching. So as you said, all of you, and I'm not going to sum up, it's a fascinating 
debate, many new ideas, but change is happening. It's not going fast enough, and everyone, governments, banks, and investors and private sector has to do much more to stimulate the move towards low carbon uh, landscape, low carbon energy. High hopes for Paris, but as I said, pledges are not enough. So please join me in thanking our panelists. There's coffee outside, and I'd like all of you to be back by about 10.30 because we have an interesting conversation, as I said, with James Hansen. So please, thank you for your questions as well, and thank you to the panel.